Hey there, let's talk about CyberGreen qPCR, a powerful technique used in molecular biology for detecting and measuring specific DNA or RNA sequences in a sample. So, CyberGreen qPCR uses a special fluorescent dye called CyberGreen, which attaches to the double-stranded DNA during amplification. This leads to an increase in fluorescence, which can be measured at each amplification cycle. This allows scientists to accurately quantify the target sequence. CyberGreen qPCR is used in clinical settings to detect a variety of diseases caused by infectious agents like bacteria, viruses, and fungi. It's a highly sensitive and specific technique that can detect even a small amount of the target sequence in a patient sample. This means it can be used for diagnosis, monitoring disease progression, and predicting treatment response. Some examples of diseases that can be detected using CyberGreen qPCR in clinical settings include COVID-19, influenza, tuberculosis, hepatitis B and C, human papillomavirus, or HPV, and many others. It's also used in research settings for gene expression analysis, genotyping, and detection of genetic mutations associated with diseases. Let me explain to you the principle of CyberGreen qPCR. It involves three main steps. Step 1. Denaturation. In this step, the double-stranded DNA, or DSDNA template, is heated to a high temperature, usually 95 degrees Celsius, to separate the two strands. This process is called denaturation. Step 2. Annealing. The temperature is then lowered to allow primers, which are short DNA sequences that are complementary to the target sequence, to bind to the single-stranded DNA, or SSDNA template, at specific regions. This process is called annealing. Step 3. Extension. In this step, DNA polymerase adds nucleotides to the primers, creating a new strand of DSDNA. During this process, the cyber green dye binds to the newly synthesized DSDNA, resulting in an increase in fluorescent signal. The amplification and detection process is repeated multiple times, with the amount of DSDNA doubling at each cycle. After each cycle, the amount of fluorescence emitted by the cyber green dye is measured, allowing the quantification of the initial amount of target DNA or RNA in the sample. The cycle at which the fluorescent signal reaches a predetermined threshold, known as the cycle threshold or CT value, is used to calculate the amount of target sequence in the original sample. Let me explain how CyberGreen qPCR works. First, we need to prepare the sample by extracting and purifying RNA, and then reverse transcribing it into cDNA. Next, we add specific primers to the cDNA and amplify it using a thermal cycler. Now let's talk about the detection step using CyberGreen dye. CyberGreen is a commonly used nucleic acid stain in molecular biology, belonging to the family of cyber dyes produced by Molecular Probes Inc., now a subsidiary of Thermo Fisher Scientific. This asymmetrical cyanine dye is capable of binding to DNA, forming a stable DNA dye complex that maximally absorbs blue light at 497 nanometers and emits green light. Its chemical name is N-N-dimethyl-N-4-E-3-methyl-1-3-benzothiazole-2-illidine-methyl-1-phenylquinolin-1-EM-2-IL-N-propylpropane-1-3-diamine, with a molecular formula of C32H37N4S+. This dye binds to all double-stranded DNA that is being synthesized during qPCR, emitting fluorescence that can be detected by the machine in real time. This dye-based detection is cost-effective, but less specific as it can bind to any double-stranded DNA, not just the target sequence. Moving on to the cyber green assay, as the PCR reaction progresses, the TAC polymerase creates new copies of the target sequence, and the cyber green dye is added to the reaction mix. 
The dye then binds to the double-stranded DNA products generated, emitting fluorescence that is directly proportional to the amount of double-stranded DNA present in the reaction. We can measure this fluorescence using a fluorescent plate reader. After the amplification step, we perform a melting curve analysis to check that the amplified DNA sequence is really the one we're interested in. The melting temperature, Tm, of a DNA duplex refers to the temperature at which half of the DNA strands are in the single-stranded denatured state and half are in the double-stranded hybridized state. The TM is affected by several factors, including the length of the DNA strands, the concentration of the salt in the buffer, the presence of divalent cations such as magnesium 2+, and the ratio of cytosine C and guanine G nucleotides to adenine A and thymine T nucleotides in the DNA sequence, also known as CG ratio. The C-G ratio refers to the relative abundance of C and G nucleotides compared to A and T nucleotides in the DNA sequence. C and G nucleotides form three hydrogen bonds with each other, while A and T nucleotides form two hydrogen bonds. Therefore, DNA sequences with a higher C-G ratio have a higher TM than sequences with a lower C-G ratio. The length of the primer, which is a short single-stranded DNA sequence that binds to a complementary target sequence during PCR, polymerase chain reaction, can also affect the TM. Generally, longer primers have a higher TM than shorter primers. To do this, we gradually increase the temperature of the reaction mixture while keeping an eye on the fluorescence intensity of the cyber green dye. As the temperature increases, the double-stranded DNA starts to break apart into single strands, which causes the fluorescence intensity of cyber green to decrease. The temperature at which half of the double-stranded DNA has dissociated into single strands is called the melting temperature, or TM. The TM is specific to the DNA sequence and depends on its length, GC content, and base composition. We increase the temperature by small increments, usually 0.5 to 1 degree Celsius per step, while monitoring the fluorescence intensity during the melting curve analysis. A typical melting curve will show a sharp decrease in fluorescence as the temperature approaches the TM, followed by a rapid decrease as the double-stranded DNA completely dissociates into single strands. The shape of the melting curve can tell us whether the PCR reaction was specific to our target DNA sequence. A single peak in the melting curve means that we successfully amplified only the desired DNA sequence. However, multiple peaks can indicate the presence of nonspecific products or primer dimers. Primer dimers occur when the forward and reverse primers anneal to each other instead of the target DNA sequence. This interference can cause inaccurate qPCR quantification, so it's important to keep an eye out for them during the melting curve analysis. Lastly, we use data analysis to calculate the amount of DNA present in the sample. The first step is pre-processing the raw data we obtain from the qPCR instrument. This involves getting rid of any background noise or signal generated by non-target DNA sequences or contaminants. Next up, we need to determine the amplification efficiency of the qPCR reaction. This is done by calculating the slope of the amplification curve generated during the PCR reaction. We use this efficiency measure to understand how much the target DNA sequence is amplified with each PCR test. Then comes the threshold determination step. We set a fluorescent signal threshold, which is the point at which the signal generated by the amplification of the target DNA sequence exceeds a certain value. This threshold can be set manually or automatically by the qPCR instrument software, and it is used to determine the cycle threshold CT value. The CT value is the cycle number at which the fluorescent signal generated by the amplification of the target DNA sequence reaches the threshold value. We calculate this value for each well of the qPCR plate, and it helps us quantify the amount of target DNA sequence present in the sample. 
Data normalization is a crucial step in qPCR data analysis. We use it to correct for variations in the amount and quality of the input DNA template and the efficiency of the PCR reaction. There are several methods for data normalization, including the use of internal controls, reference genes, or normalization factors. Finally, we can subject the qPCR data to statistical analysis to determine the significance of the results and to compare the relative abundance of the target DNA sequence in different samples.